Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to another Divino Talk. Here uh, today we have uh, our good friend Giancarlo Luigi from Ripe Wine Imports. Hello, Giancarlo. Hello. Thank you for having and, me. Yes, yes. Um, today uh, we're going to talk about um, a couple of delicious wines, of course, that we carry at Divino, uh, thanks to Giancarlo and, and Ripe. Right, wine imports. Um, these are two wines from um, the region of Catalonia in Spain, two, uh, two specific um, appellations, right? They are neighbor appellations. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are wines that we've been, we're very happy to, to carry at the store, uh, where customers love both of them. And uh, who else than my good friend uh, Giancarlo to talk about them? I have to say actually that Giancarlo and I go back to 20 years or so yeah. uh, in the music business. Giancarlo, for the ones that don't know, is a great shaker player, uh, percussionist, and we've had the, the opportunity to reconnect uh, uh, recently playing with a, a mutual friend, playing music and traveling. Anyway, that's uh, another conversation. Uh, yeah. All right, Giancarlo, what is, what is it about uh, these two delicious wines we're gonna talk about today? Well, uh, thank you so much for having me again. It's a real pleasure to be here, um, to have the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite wine regions in Spain, Catalonia. And so Catalonia, if you can sort of visualize a map, uh, we are in the northeast corner of Spain, uh, if you know where Barcelona is. So it's the region around Barcelona, the wine region. We are very close to the Mediterranean Sea, and so this has an important influence in this region, um, as well as the rest of the European continent. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to be tasting two wines uh, from two different appellations, um, what are known in Spanish as denominations or denominaciones de origen. Um, the first from a region called Conca de Barbera, is a wine, uh, a wine from Conca de Barbera by a producer called Josep Foraster, and it's made from a grape called Crepat, uh, an indigenous and very special variety from this region. Uh, and then the second one we'll talk about uh, will be from the region of Priorat, and this is a producer called Sesca Vicente, um, and it's a red blend, and again, also a very unique region that um, uh, that are, like Neil mentioned, are neighboring regions. And, and that's particularly interesting because of, they make very different styles of wine because of their climate. Um, Catalonia, in general, is a very hot region. They get a lot of sun. And so in the summer, you get very, very hot summers. Um, uh, a lot of uh, sunlight, um, and so this tends to make wine, um, in particular, when we think about Priorat, the red that we're going to taste, wines that are quite a bit more robust, the grapes can ripen quite a bit more, a uh, uh, little biology there, you know, um, uh, plants turn sunlight uh, into um, uh, essentially sugar uh, in the fruit. And so the more sunlight you have, the more sh potential sugar you can create in the fruit. That sugar then turns into alcohol, So, which is one of the measurements of body sometimes in wine. So uh, we can get robust wines from Priorat. However, the very interesting thing about what we're going to do in this tasting is that this neighboring region to Priorat, just to the north, called Conca de Barbera, is a very unique microclimate. It's a little bit more elevation. Um, it's about, uh, their holdings are between, I think, four and 800 meters of elevation. And, and so this uh, gives a little bit if you can imagine elevation like a top of a mountain makes a cooler climate. And so the grapes sort of rest a little bit. They don't get that much heat. 
And then two other important features. I mentioned that Catalonia is close to the Mediterranean Sea. And so this also has a very important uh, influence. Um, um, in Priorat, there's a, uh, the, the Mediterranean Sea is a warm body of water. So there's a warm influence in Priorat. But in the Conca de Barbera, the region that makes the, the Trepat, the Cava, which we'll taste in a moment, this warm air from the Mediterranean climbs a set of mountains. Conca de Barbera is like a, 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 a valley. It's like in a little bowl surrounded by uh, mountains. And so if you can imagine the warm Mediterranean air coming, climbing the, this mountain, and when it climbs, it cools and it loses its humidity, which is very important. So then when it arrives at the Conca de Barbera from the Mediterranean, it's cool and dry. And this is very helpful. In use, um, it allows Josep Forastel, the cava producer, to grow organic fruit. So it minimizes the use of, uh, they don't have to use pesticides and herbicides. They only use natural treatments in the vineyards, which I think is very great. That's, that's a, it's amazing, um, Giancarlo, that, um, I mean, all these details that you're explaining and are saying, um, you know, that I just says a little bit of biology, a little bit of, uh, you know, science, um, mm -hmm. when it comes to just to make wine, you know? Yeah. And we, we have no idea uh, how much is behind uh, the, yeah. the, the art and the science of, of um, wine making. Absolutely. Um, yeah, one thing that we, we talked before, and I actually knew uh, because of you, it's the, um, and I want, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like you to, to talk about it, is the, is the soil, right? <laughs> uh, is the, what is called a licorella. Yes. Right? Which is uh, it's a very specific, um, um, you know, I know the red slates that, that, you know, conserve the heat as well as project uh, no, the, the heat. Well, why don't you talk about a little bit about this? The, the Absolutely. Uh, it's a cool thing to have in the back of the mind. What Neil asked about in Priorat is really fascinating. Slate, and here I, I have a, 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 a small understanding, but as I understand it, it's a very old soil. And what that means is if you imagine like, soil being like layers of geologic time, you know, and the oldest ones are at the bottom and then the, something else happens, it gets on top of that and, and you know, let's call it slate, sand and, and, and clay and, and, and granite. Anyway, slate is a very old soil and in a long time ago in the geo geologic record, millions of years ago, due to tectonic movements, this soil was pushed up and so this old soil is generally very buried in the geologic record in this hill that is pure was pushed up so you can imagine like this kind of and so the slate is exposed and priorat is this hill very small region in spain very unique in that it's all slate soil which is like pieces of rock. I don't know if you, like, sometimes you see slate countertops. Sometimes you see slate, uh, I think there's some in New York, upstate New York, anyhow. Um, and so what that means is that, I mean, it's very poor soil, which is important because actually it's one of the funny things about wine. Poor soil makes good wine. And what that means is like the, the vine, interestingly, if, if the vine struggles, <laughs> it actually produces better wine. And part of why that is, is that if you have very fertile soils, very, very prolific, high organic content and material, soils that are good to grow food, like potatoes and beets and carrots and greens and things, and you plant vines there, they'll make a lot of bunches of fruit. They'll be very prolific, but they'll sort of dilute their energy into many, many bunches. Right. And so the grape that you get, the fruit that you harvest, will lack what in the industry we call a uh, concentration. And so if you think a, a, a parallel uh, world here, you know, it, like Priorat, very poor soils, they're rocks, the vines grow through these rocks and the roots go through these rocks very deep 
into the rocks to try to get at the water and the nutrients deep in the ground. Um, it also actually it helps anchor the vines. The vines are holding onto rock, and so the they get pretty pretty good strong winds in Priorat. It won't lift up the vines, which in some other regions of the world, winemakers have to take measures to to keep the wind from literally take pulling up the vine, like in Tenerife, for example. So that's yeah, a whole other yeah, conversation. yeah. We have a we have a wine uh, uh, Malvasia, and they it's because of the wind, and, and it's actually it's a soil. It's um it's more of a sandy soil, so <laughs> so yeah, they have to they dig these big holes, and and they are kind of. Um, planted like a little bit below ground Correct. to get protection. But it's fascinating, man, because it's, it's, um, it's like a, the, you know, the, the concept of poor soil, better wine is completely, is opposite to, to what it is for, for, I guess, the role, uh, rule, rule of thumb for, for regular um, agriculture. farming, you know, agriculture. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. true. And, and I, I, you know, still, People, you know, try to don't know how to put that together, how that works. So, yeah. so I'm glad that you explained that. All right, so let's go to our first um, wine, which is I got mine today. Uh, yeah, Joseph Forrester Cava, Trepat Rosé. Now that Rosé season is, uh, yes, it's, it's right here. You see all the sun um, coming through the windows for both of us. <laughs> yes, uh, spring yeah. is as spring. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to pour myself a little bit here. And, uh, okay, so this is, um, yeah, it's a rosé, um, trepad, which is an indigenous grape. Yes. Uh, from the, um, from the and I, I, um, I love trepat. Uh, it's um, it's a variety that's very unique in Spain. Um, uh, there's only, if I understand, about 1,100 hectare of it in the world. A thousand of those hectare are in the Conca de Barbera, this small region. Wow. That it has only about, call it less than 30 producers, I think like 26 producers or so. Mm -hmm. So very, very small compared to Priorat, which is also a very small region, but it has about 100 or a little over 100 producers. Right. Um, and, and so, yes, it is very pale uh, uh, color. Um, it is kind of in the screen on my side. I mean, it's looking very, but you can see how pale it is, even though it looks kind of white, right? It, it's a pale salmon color, uh, slight copper notes. Um, it, beautiful um, berries, maybe um, strawberries. strawberries, and and yeah. and maybe even today it's interesting. I'm getting like stone fruits. I'm getting stone fruit too, like uh, like peach. Um, yeah, nectarine or so, which yeah. is unique actually. Yeah. Um, and trepat, eh, if we can. Well, uh, bueno, salud, cheers, salud. Uh, Neo. I, yeah. <laughs> mm, very fresh, mm -hmm. very clean. Cava is made in the champagne method. So, very fine bubble. So, what this means is, uh, yes, uh, fine perlage. What this means is different from prosecco and other sparkling wine uh, types. The champagne method, uh, in a in a nutshell. <laughs> Um, to make a wine in this method, you make a base wine, and um, so that means you you harvest the fruit. You make this slightly more acidic, uh, slightly lower alcohol wine, um, and you take this wine and you fill uh, bottles um, with it, and then you add a little bit of yeast. And a liqueur d'expedition, like a, a little bit of um, some little more food for the yeast. It could be either sugar, which Joseph Parra said is new. I think they do either must or juice from the from the uh, any must from the previous fermentation. Anyhow, food for the secondary fermentation to occur. So they put the wine in here. They uh, the base wine. They add some yeast, a little bit of uh, sugar of some sort. And they put a like a beer cap on this, and slowly over the course uh, of time, uh, 
well, the yeast eat um, uh, the sugar in the juice that you've reintroduced, but uh, the two byproducts of fermentation, carbon dioxide and alcohol. So the secondary fermentation happens uh, inside the bottle. This is uh, how you get, make the wine sparkling, the secondary fermentation. And so since uh, you've put a crown cap on the bottle, the carbon dioxide has nowhere to go and it stays, remains suspended in the wine. Also what happens is the spent yeast is also suspended in the wine. After the secondary fermentation, the yeast is still hanging out in there. They're, they've already done their job. They've, they've passed away. <laughs> they're, in, they're suspended in the wine. But part of what this does is aging the wine on these lees, they're called lees, or the spent yeast after fermentation, gives the wine complexity. There's, I think in the Cava region, 15 months is minimum. But for this wine, Joseph Forrester, I think they do 20 to 22 months of aging on the lees. This gives richness and complexity uh, to the wine. That uh, a wine, for example, like Prosecco, all of these processes that I've described happen in a very large, uh, huge stainless steel tanks, and the wine is bottled uh, under pressure. This means that the complexity of Prosecco is a little bit more simple, but it's kind of like, exactly. there's nothing wrong with that. It's exactly what you want with Prosecco. Prosecco is a very uh, fun, jovial wine. Right. Um, I'll say about uh, Cava and Champagne Method wines a couple of things. They are almost the perfect food pairing wine. So you can pair Cava Champagne with just about everything. I mean, I wouldn't do chocolate and things like this, but uh, it is eminently versatile. If you're going to a dinner party, you don't know what they're making, bring Cava, bring Champagne Method wines. Uh, um, because they're, they, they, you can have them at the beginning, you know, sort of before the meal. You can have them with aperitifs. You can have them with the meal. You can have them after the meal, when you're, after the, when you're hanging out. You can have them to, to toast friends that you haven't seen in a long time, which we're all looking, we very much looking forward to. <laughs> I'm going to secure a, a, a bottle of uh, cava for our meeting. Uh, you know, when we, when, we, when we get to see each other. A reunion. But, yeah. So um, I'm glad that you actually point out the, the you know, what, what's the best pairing for it because, um, you know, it, the, I would say the bu bubbles, in, in, in the case of bubbles, uh, Prosecco is probably the most popular uh, sparkling wine. Just because it's, you know, it, it, it fits, you know, in every situation. You got the, you know, the, the mimosas, you have the you know, brunch. And, and then, you know, you have champagne, which uh, suppose a bit, something a bit more elegant, uh, big party, a big celebration, or, you know, mm. something very specific. Yeah. But in Cava, people think, okay, this is Spanish uh, sparkling wine. Yeah. But I know Prosecco already, and I know Champagne already, so yeah. why go with Cava? So it's a good, yeah. it's a good point just to, just to uh, um, uh, bring up, you know, the options and the possibilities uh, that in terms of great. pairing. Absolutely. You know, you, like you very well say, uh, Neil, you have Prosecco on one side, you know, very fun, easy, simple one. Yeah. You have Champagne on the other, maybe things for celebrations and, and you know, because it's, you know, Part of it is like it, it costs a lot, you know, champagne costs a lot of money, you know. So Cava is, is a nice right in between and closer to Prosecco because if you spend 22 bucks 20 so, or so on a bottle of Cava, ah, it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's within, you know, it's within reach. And, mm -hmm. and, and I always encourage people, don't wait for a celebration. Just have it on a Tuesday night. Um, have it with... Uh, seafood have it with uh, scallops have it um with a light uh, spring salad you know have it with uh, uh I, the ramps are up right now uh, in the farmer's market oh my god sauteed ramps um um salt pepper olive oil wow. period and, you know and a little baguette or some little uh, fresh goat cheese you know it's um if you know our farmers market has cucumbers and fresh tomatoes coming up from greenhouse but uh that and a baguette or a piece of oh my god it's a party and actually in catalonia they do this party now in the spring oh, i forget the name of it right now 
but it, it, they make calzots, I think, <clears throat> if I recall in Catalan. <clears throat> what is They're it? Spring onions, grilled spring onions and romesco sauce. Whoa. That's oh my so God. Cool. I'm telling you, no, I mean, look this up. It's grilled spring onions, romesco and sauce, you know, and, and you drink wine. <laughs> And you just eat that. That's it. It's delicious. I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna take your word for for the Tuesday <laughs> Cava drinking. Okay, <laughs> I think you're, telling, you're gonna you're thank me for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and again, now that the, the weather is it's getting better, it's definitely yeah. a, a good a good time to do so. Okay, so let's move on and try the next wine, Giancarlo. So now yeah. we're gonna go to Priorat, where we have this delicious wine. The yes, indeed. Descent. Yes, indeed. And so, um, for a glass. Perfecto. Myself. All right. Salud. Salud Anil. Um, and so, yes, this wine takes us to Priorat. And like I mentioned earlier, Priorat, a very unique uh, region, perhaps, in the opinion of some, next to Rioja, uh, the most well known appellation for uh, red wine in Spain. In terms of uh, familiarity, uh, uh, of course, there are many, uh, I, I would throw Bierzo into the ring in, in that, but that's a conversation for another of these videos. Mm -hmm. um, but Priorat, um, a long history of one making, I think uh, it goes back to the 12th century here, uh, um, as far as we can tell from the records, um, viticulture, so that's uh, eight, 800 years or so. Um, this very unique feature of Priorat, the Licorella soils, uh, make, uh, and, and this combined with this warm Mediterranean climate makes rich, robust reds. Um, right. This is a blend of about 50% Grenache, Garnacha, the in, another indigenous grape to Catalonia, like Trepat, uh, also indigenous, um, Cariñena, another indigenous uh, variety to Catalonia, um, and then also, interestingly, in this appellation, we find uh, Bordelese varieties. Um, so there's Merlot in this blend, there's Cabernet Sauvignon in this blend, and there's a little bit of Syrah in this blend. So it's a really unique um, uh, uh, region. I think of it sometimes like an, it, it's like the gateway to the rest of uh, Europe. And so... Um, you can think of Catalonia right, right uh, at uh, the, the doorstep of France at the Pyrenees there. And so uh, you have this region that has many different uh, varieties in the blend. Uh, one way to sort of uh, conceptualize uh, right. these wines. And the, these, uh, um, beautiful, I mean, talking about the slate soil, these ones always for me have this like, mm, um sort of stoniness uh one way you can sort of imagine it the smell uh, the next time you're at a riverbed and on a hot it's difficult this this phenomena phenomena of petrichor how rain smells when it hits a uh, hot uh, stone you know that smell <laughs> right, right. Interesting. yeah and so yeah. there's yeah. something about this from the ligorella soil i think um Nice ripe uh, black fruits, uh, red plums. Um, uh, there's an intensity here that I think is very, very, quite quite sure. special. Salut. Mm. Lovely lushness. Mm. Got a little bit of um um uh, uh I want to say like, like a little spicy taste I guess is the you know aftertaste I, I guess the, the wood right the, um, there, there's a there's a few things told? yes for sure uh, um, um first uh, the body of this wine this is a clearly full bodied wine and so this wine I think is around sixteen degrees alcohol it is. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and so and so this you know we went from very light to quite robust mm -hmm. i i will say uh one thing uh, right before uh this video i had this in the fridge maybe 20 minutes or so and i think any red you should drink slightly chilled i think in america oftentimes you drink our reds too hot and our whites too cold 
fucking cellar temperature. Anyway, that that sensation of that black pepper spiciness comes from its robustness, and part of that is its its alcohol. Um, so this is a wine for robust fare: burgers, steaks, um, robust mushroom dishes, risottos. Some you know, big big burly fare. Uh, not a shy wine, but still right. very balanced. One of the things that it is so impressive about Sesca Vicente uh, uh, is that her wines have freshness. Even though this wine is, um, is so full body, it actually, I always, is light on its feet. It dances, you know? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an interesting way to put it uh, because it could be as related to a Bordeaux wine because of a, of a blend and, and mm -hmm. the robustness, but, it, but it's got some subtleness uh it's got as you said you know it's like it's light on its feet absolutely um, yeah w one thing you know i i, I mentioned sesca vicent's name and so i feel i feel it's important to to talk about her she's like a matriarch in priorat uh um she has roots in this region uh, to the 16th century um she's a fifth generation uh winemaker um she is a female winemaker, which is in Spain rare. Um, and, and even more so, she is now, her daughter is, she's taking her daughter under her wing to perpetuate uh, the vineyard. Sesca is a, a dynamo of energy. I had the great pleasure of, of meeting her in person in Priorat. It's a great story, you know. Priorat are these kind of hills. We talked about the slate soil, so these, these rolling kind of stone hills, kind of very beautiful. She, and, you know, she's driving, got one hand on the on the wheel, and she's kind of looking at me and the other and chatting, you know. And I'm like, you know, Siska, maybe you, get <laughs> you look at the, like, whining through. Her energy is amazing. When I say she's a dynamo, I mean, she she's just walk, running and, and doing and... She, I had heard about this. I heard she doesn't stand still. And when I saw it, I was like, oh my, it's, it's, a, it's just incredible. I mean, it, so no. I think part of that energy is it, that vibrancy is in her Absolutely. wine. Absolutely. And it makes sense, not only the fact that, you know, it's a female winemaker and it's, it's you know, she's, it's a, there's quite a different energy. And, and you know, we, we devote a whole section in our shop of a, a you know, female winemaker wines. And, mm -hmm. and yes, there is something, you know, subtle about the energy of, of that wine and mm. and you know it, it might be too subtle to see it at once but uh, mm. but when we know what's going on behind every bottle and yeah. you know these kind of stories you're, you're telling yeah. even more you know we feel that the, the connection with that with that you know with that process absolutely uh, if you, absolutely you go to the other extreme and you grab a, a bottle of wine from a major you know producer or a major brand mm. uh, you know, you, you might be able to at some point tell how, you know, it's just even and, yeah. and you know, there is, there is the dynamic. It's, it's really not as dynamic. Yeah. yeah. When you it, talk it, about it, sort of industrial yeah. production. Right. So, so yes, I'm glad that it, you point that out. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, I'd be, I'd be curious to, to meet her and to see, you know, uh, how to know how, how, you know, how, how the approach is in a, in her case, because yeah, yeah. as you say, I mean, these are, bold ones that are there you know but 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 got that, i guess that's feminine touch right yeah, that, yeah absolutely um and um so i i i, I encourage you i hope i wish that we were our viewers were tasting this go to divino and, and taste so you can see that that freshness when we talk about freshness um we're going to get a little technical here part of what we're talking about is this sort of mouth-watering aspect of the wine because robust full-bodied wines can get very tannic they can get very dry but when we talk about freshness vibrancy it's a it's a mouth-watering is the opposite scale it, it gives lift to the wine it gives energy to the wine it doesn't sort of like weigh you down it kind of lifts you up a little bit so um this this is um this is part of what that vibrancy, that freshness, that high notes, you know? Right. Being, being musicians, I, um, I actually, I oftentimes use sound metaphors. How do you talk about wine, right? So it's sound metaphors. And so high tone. Yeah. Wines that have that, when we talk about high tone, it'd be kind of like the treble, like the triangles, the, 
the, the you know, the sounds that are uh, uh, brighter as opposed to bass. Right, right. right. Which this, this, this one has plenty of bottom in it. You know, it's full bodied. It's got weight. We talk about weight, which kind of moves down. We talk about freshness, it kind of moves up. Right. Um, I'm, 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 I'm glad that you, you bring, that, uh, uh, bring that up, you know, because uh, for me, it's been a, a, quite an experience to, um, to get into wine. I'm very new in the wine world. Uh, but I've been playing music for a long time. And, and I, you know, going from just wine lover to kind of understand a little bit more mm. everything that's related to, you know, viticulture and, and winemaking. And there is a relationship. Mm. It's, it's a form of art yes. as well as, a, you know, as a science. And, and yes. in music, it's the same in a way. You know, we talk about textures. We yes. talk about, you know, bold, big thing. I find it very curious that there are a good number of wine professionals in New York City who who started off as musicians. You know, mm. uh, I, I, I there's a, there's a list in my mind of some of the top people in the industry right now who 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 have an appreciation for something about that aesthetic taste um, that 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 harmonizes very nicely with wine in, in many, many ways. You know, it's not only that we love wine, you know, we, but that there's, there's something that, you know, art, artists, musicians, you know, to develop a sensibility to, to, to these, also the subtleties. I mean, cause Neil, we talked about dynamics, right? For, for our listener, well, I, our listeners might not know what dynamics mean. So what, what, how would you define dynamics in, in music? Mostly when you have percussion instruments that, that are very, you know, like uh, linear, like, you know, ping, you hit a bell, you hit something and it's just this one sound. And, but you want to make sure that many of those sounds are interacting in a way that, that it's pleasing or, or, or generates, you know, it's telling a story. So I, I, I would think that, you know, that's a way to put dynamic. But listen, man, I got a plan. And my yeah. plan is... Uh, I'm gonna take, you know, eventually maybe you, you wanna join me. Yeah. You know, a little a little uh, spot in Prospect Park right here. Yeah. And you know, work on that soil and then come up with a you know BP appellation or something like that. Prospect Park, you know, uh, you know, we're on DOC here and, and, and see what happens, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, see what happens. It takes 40 I love years it, Neil. So. I love it. Bro Brooklyn yeah. wine. I'm, you know, we're ready for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Listen, Ricardo, thank you so much, man. It was a great, great pleasure thank talking you. with you. Um, thank you. You know, my good friend, Giancarlo. And, um, Always a pleasure. And, you know, tasting these two delicious wine from uh, the Catalonia region. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll do this again. Uh, oh, uh, you have, you, you know, you are... Uh, and, uh, ripe imports, you guys have a great catalog of Thank you so these kind of wines that are, you know, uh, sustainable, uh, small producers, yes. uh, female winemakers, you know, they, that they, they really care, uh, you know, with, on the process of, of the making of it and, and also, you know, the relationship between, you know, the soil and the, what goes in the bottle. Thank so you. Thank you. you. Um, uh, ripe and, um, We'll be in touch. We'll see you. It sounds back. great. Uh, I, 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 I thank you so much for this opportunity, Neil. This has been so much fun. Um, I, just closing thoughts. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, so much of this is a people, you know, relationships, you know, the, 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 the Foraster, Ricard Foraster, the winemaker, dear friend, you know, Sesca Vicente, a matriarch is the word I used to describe her, you know, <laughs> um, Neil, you know, 20 year friendship, you know, um, and and wine is really like this bridge that it's this is this link you know we can use in our it, with with the people that we love the people that are close to us uh to 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 share life and and food and and stories and uh and this is the best so it, it, it's it lovely lovely to be here with you neil uh till next time man cheers Same to you okay salud. be well Ciao. likewise likewise salute